Hi, I'm Bob Danslow, and uh, today I'm going to read from a, a book by Rick Bragg, who happens to be a, a person that uh, numerous people in our little group here has kind of discovered. And so we have uh, a number of different uh, stories by him. But today I'm going to read one from uh, his about a, uh, uh, a speckled beauty is the name of the book by Rick Bragg. And it's about anybody who's ever owned a rescue dog would identify with this story. But he writes in this wonderful Alabama fashion. And so here we go with the speckled beauty. The driveway is a winding quarter mile, a dim green tunnel through tangled pines and mountain pasture, fractured by dappled sunlight on the clear hot days. Flashes of color, blue jays, yellow hammers, and an emerald blur of hummingbirds crisscross the rusted barbed wire, and mockingbirds touch down on cedar posts that were cut from this mountain 100 years before. White-tailed deer and wild turkeys like periscopes spy over tall, sharp blades of Johnson grass, and white egrets, rare here in the red dirt, up so high, pose on one leg in the flat brown water of the pond. And it all seems painted on somehow, as if someone dreamed it up on a slow day with an easy mind and hung it on the air. And then he rumbles in and goes to raising all kinds of hell. The dog, running half blind, tongue out and wide open, intercepts my truck halfway up the drive as the wild thing scatters to the corners of the earth. He yowls, twists, and bounces to a hard stop right on some mark only he can find, usually smike dab in the red ant bed or a mud hole, but always safely away from the main road as if he can remember all the meanness and suffering there, and knows this mountain is his sanctuary and his last stand. Run too far, and you'll fall off the world. I know this is reading a lot into a dog who falls asleep in his food bowl, suffering a shivering apoplexy when you rub his belly, and acts as if every wayward possum is a sign of the end of times. But I don't think any dog knows home better than one thrown away once already. This is, though, pretty much the sum of his comprehension. He seems to forget every waking day that a one-ton truck is not to be messed with and, biting at the spinning tires, tries to herd it up the drive like a big sparkly cow. He'll move, people say, but everyone is an expert when it's not their dog in the road. But I can never recall which side his bad eye is on, so I stomp the brake and twist the wheel and finally, lurching, cursing, arrive at the cabin at the top of the hill. I swing open the door and the dog, 76 pounds of wet hair and poor decisions, lunges in, eternally surprised and overjoyed that it is me. I yell, get down, but too late. The truck's cab is tattooed in dirt, mud, or biting ants because he needs to squirm to within an inch of my face to be sure. I might have been UPS or the man from Cherokee Electric who has learned to bring a stick. Then with a growl, he is off to molest the livestock, a stern general panic. He is a herding dog by blood, an illegitimate Australian sheepdog, that he bolts into the pasture to create a small stampede. He evades the thumping hooves by inches, but always gets caught up in a never-ending circle and cannot find his way out, like a drunk teenager doing donuts in a parking lot. I stumble after him, yelling, threatening, and he hunkers down, covers his eyes with his paws. I used to think he did it out of shame, but now I think he believes this makes him invisible. Recently, I came home from a week-long trip to find the driveway peaceful and empty, the terrible dog nowhere around. It always made me a little nervous when he didn't rush down to meet me as much as any creature I've ever known he has lived to brink away from destruction. My brother Sam was in the barn beating an old Yanmar tractor with a hammer. He had, he had gotten hot again and it scalded him, so he was ill-tempered and short, which is his most natural state. I don't know if he was working on it or just getting even. You seen my dog, I asked. He's in jail, he said. Again. In the dog's first month here, he was incarcerated 29 times. Telling him to behave, even after almost two years now, is like telling him it's Tuesday. What, I asked, what did he do now? He ran the mule, he said. I told him that was not so bad, a dog running one solitary mule. Ran the mule, ran the donkeys, ran them half to death. Ran them round and round the pasture, biting at their legs. Ran them till they went to blowing and bucking and screaming and tried to kick them to death. Don't know where he wanted them to go. Don't think he did. Well, what else, I asked, because there was always something else. Dragged part of an old deer dead up to the house. Stunk worse than anything I ever smelt. Laid there chewing on a leg bone by the kitchen window. You can still smell it. He paused to let his contempt gather like an old creaky train cresting a hill. Picked a fight with Mama's puppy, stole the puppy's ball, took it off, and buried it. When I fed him, he wouldn't let the puppy eat, went and laid in the puppy's bowl and growled. He pointed to a puddle in the middle of the garage floor. Peed on the tractor, peed on the truck, peed on Mama's flowers, 
The zinnias looked like they'd been poisoned. So Mama told me to lock him up. He set down the hammer and picked up a wrench, twisted it grisly on a rusted bolt like he was tightening a noose and realized he had left something out. Oh, he ate all the cat food Mama put out, cats flying everywhere. I laughed and he shot me a dirty look. Does not leave him like cats, which are too well fed to catch mice and have no practical use. How he must loathe my dog to take the side of a cat. He went back to abusing the tractor, mumbling around a bit of deep of snuff. He says, I could only make out about every third word, but the gist, I believe, was that I never should have let that dog take root here in the first place and should have run him off immediately and permanently with a handful of rocks. A pitiful stray is one thing. You can save a gentle stray. But a dog like this, wild for so long, it would only bring woe. He didn't say woe, but that was what he meant. Sometimes when my dog walked too close to him, he spit on his head. Sam owed, owned only ob obedient, serious dogs, and there is no room in his mind for a dog that cannot work for a living or do what it is told. He grew up in a time when even the best dogs lived at the end of a logging chain and ate from an upside-down hubcap. He dosed their mange with burnt motor oil and dressed their wounds in kerosene. They were throwaway dogs, too. Earless, toothless, chewed on, stitched up, and gun-shy, but they loaded themselves into the truck dog's box without being told, trailed a scent across miles and miles, and stayed on a tree till he kicked them off it. His dogs would swim a river for him. All he had to do was whistle. So you've got to train a dog, got to make a mind, he said, making it plain that everything wrong was my dog, it was my fault. I had tried to train the dog for months, for years, and he had miserably failed. Giving him a command of any kind was fruitless, bordering on stupid. I might as well read him the song of Hiawatha or sang on Wisconsin. I had to heave him into the truck like a sack of fertilizer every time I took him to the veterinarian or to lure him in with cold cuts. Fancy dog people, you know, the ones who play fetch with their pets in German and feed them only healthy, joyless food, said I should speak to him in a deep, strong voice to show him I was the alpha male. If this failed, they said, I should smack him smartly on the nose with a rolled-up newspaper. But they have not met my dog. He has the attention span of a tick on a hot rock, and by the time I found a newspaper and rolled it up, he would not remember what he was being punished for. I would just be a big, mean man beating a befuddled dog with a Walmart circular. You could beat him with a stick of firewood, my brother said, but he was kidding, and I was almost sure. Or he said, a short length of two-by-four. The pen was, I guess, more humane. How did you lure him in, I asked. My mother's disembodied voice came from the other side of the screen door. I made him a mayonnaise sandwich, he said, and he walked right in. I guess there was nothing else to do then, I said. Well, he went on my best rug, my mother's voice said. And I know, I said, I'm sorry. There was no answer. She had moved on. The dog even had me apologizing to a screen door. It was the grave robbing, my brother said, that sealed it. They could forgive the rest of it, even a certain amount of careless urination. He was a boy dog, after all. But if there was a corpse of any kind close by, one left lying by a careless deer hunter or hastily covered over by some poacher, he'd find it, dig it up, drag it here, gnaw on it, till I took it away gagging. The closest human cemetery was blessedly several miles away, so it was always a four-legged cadaver of some kind that he brought us. Still, I sometimes wonder if I would come home one evening to find him tugging by the dress hem or something deer's departed Aunt Loreen. Anyway, I had about all the lecture I could stand. Once when we were boys, he would have understood why I wanted this dog, and I guess the grouchy old man couldn't see it anymore. I will say one thing for him, said my brother, a good man despite that stiff back and hard head. He ain't got no fear in him. That dog would not back down from a rattlesnake. He whacked the old tractor one last good lick, so it knew he would know better the next time. Well, I got a flashlight from my truck and followed the circle of light down the path to the pen, when you walked in here, in hot weather, you walked in a kind of southern rainforest amidst creeping vines, poison ivy, and big black and yellow spiders, webs dripping silver and air so heavy it seemed to be held up by faith alone. The hum of insects and the trilling of frogs, a million at least, sang out of the dark, and glowing specks of lightning bugs winked on and off. They were flying low that night, just above the high grass. My grandma used to say that it meant it was going to rain, and there in that twinkling light, guilty as sin, and one eye shining was my dog. His left eye, a light brown, reflected the light in the way a dog's eyes are supposed to, but his right eye was almost solid blue-black, and the light from the flashlight beam just seemed to soak into it, disappear, as if he were shining it down a well. 
He was mostly blind in that eye, and sometimes if he turned too fast to that side, he ran headfirst into a fence post or a tree or side of a moving pickup truck. A thin black scar, no thicker than the line from a felt-tip pen, ran just above and below the eye like a claw mark. And I wondered if that wound was the reason someone threw him away, or if it happened later when he was fighting for his life in the hobo jungle. But the mismatched eyes did not ruin his face. They just made him look like the pirate he is. He had a striking mottled coat specific to his bloodline, a mix of blue, red, gray, black, brown, and white with copper points like freckles dotting his white face and paws. My mother called it his coat of many colors from the Bible, and I told her I was pretty sure that scripture had nothing to do with it. Still, he could look almost noble from a distance until you got close enough to see what the world had done to him and to discern that it had recently rolled in something terrible. He sat at the gate, unmoving, silent, watching the trail. He can see all right in daylight on his good side, but the dusk is hard. He cannot catch a bouncing ball or follow a bird on the wing. His depth of possession is too poor for that and it is even harder for him in the half-light. His hearing is also sketchy. Both ears were torn at the skull in his last serious dogfight, though by some miracle he can always hear the words snack and biscuit. Even his sense of smell is a little blunted. He will walk right over to a fried chicken liver if he loses sight of it in flight, but he can eat 20 of them easy with a side of fries and some yeast rolls from a paper plate on the porch. He heard me coming in the dark and barked just once, his voice hoarse and tortured. He had been wounded there, too, his neck and throat hurt in some old battle, and he had tender places in his ribs, one hip and spine, where we think he was hit with at least one car. But he was no invalid, no broke-down dog. He was strong, fast, and always hungry, always scrounging. Today he had been hollered at, kicked at, and cussed sideways, and that was just since mid-afternoon. But he'd not sulk or whine. He knew I was coming. I broke him out every night about this time. I see you, buddy, I said from the dark. I see you. He leapt as high as he could, once, twice, three times, then hurled himself in the chain leak and tried to turn some kind of pitiful, ragged flip. But he never got much more than sideways, so I guess it was more of a spin. Then he crouched, his feet beating a tattoo in the dirt, his tail going like an egg beater. I reached to the gap in the gate and pulled on his mitch-matched ears. Who's a good buddy, I said, he told me, with every thump of his tail, every quiver that he was. I had my hand on the latch when I heard the accusing screech of the screen door. Do not let him out, my mother called from the porch. She is 83 years old and has rescued dozens of unwanted and damaged dogs, but she has never suffered a fool as this. I won't, I promised, and the dog banged shut like a gavel coming down. The dog looked at me, just happy to be alive. Who can bear to see that in a cage? He took off like a shotgun blast, throwing up whirls of dead leaves and dust. He tore around the cabin, then again and again, till you could hear him breathing hard on every lap. Cats again exploded from every crevice, and every faraway dog for three miles began to yap and howl. I thought he might actually run himself to death before he finally came to some sense. On his fourth lap, he staggered up and leaned against my leg. I sat in an old lawn chair and rubbed his head. It was Jacksonville, Alabama, on a weekday night and it sure as hell didn't have anything better to do. Then I heard the screech of the door again. Hide, I told him, and he tore off again through the trees. You let him out, didn't you? My mother and brother asked, almost in stereo, when I came into the kitchen. I started to lie, but the evidence was looking at us through the screen door. I told you to hide, I told him. He rolled over and presented his belly in case anybody wanted to rub it. His tongue hang out of the side of his head. It was the only trick he was any good at, sit and stay where as yet impossible dreams. Put your tongue back in your head, my mother ordered. Nothing. Nobody wants to see that, she said. Nothing. He rolled to his feet or tried. The edge of the porch was on his blind side and he stumbled to the steps with all the grace of a rocking horse banging down a flight of stairs. He leapt into the air like he was on springs as if to show us that it was all just part of an act. He made me think of when I was a boy running around in a cape cut from a dish towel shouting, ta-da, after I tripped on my own untied shoelaces and face-planted onto the floor. I told him he was a good boy, ignoring rolling of eyes inside the house, and closed the door. He waited at the steps for a minute or two, in case I should reopen and someone would start handing out some reward. It is my fault he lives in this delusion. He believes he is a good boy, and because of the thousands of times I have lied and told him so. He may not understand much help, may not even know which way up is, but he almost levitates when he hears those words. Then he could be thinking about squirrels or scrambled eggs. After a while, he turned and trotted off into the trees. 
He usually slept in the same place in a thick copse of hardwoods at the pasture gate in case the jackasses, which he never trusted to begin with, which should stage an escape or revolt, as jackasses are known to do, had tried to gentrify the dog, tried to get him to sleep in the garage or on the porch, but he refused. He was not a dog that compromised. I gave him blankets, but he dragged them through saw briars and bushes, and they were never, not one thread, seen again. Bought him a $150 dog bed, and he lost his mind, snatched it from my hands before I could get it out of the box, and went into a weird African death roll with me clinging to the other end. We played a grim tug of war with the empty cover for pride, I guess, as the stuffing wafted down like snow. The dog calmed down only when I draped it over his head like a crazed horse in a burning barn. That night, like most nights, he woke me four or five times barking insanely at creatures real and imagined out in the trees. The last time, about 3 a.m., I gave up and went outside to sit on the porch steps, calling to him to please hush, for God's sakes, which only made him bawl and yowl even louder. He came leaping out of the dark to almost knock me down to let me know he was still on the job and that next time it could be a beat or a bear. I didn't sleep anyway. I had been ill with blood cancer, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. Everyone said it was the best kind to get, like I was buying a washing machine and after years of treatment, sitting besides brave people who had lost everything. I was in remission. I had good doctors and people praying who, unlike me, would not burst into flame. But the chemo made me stupid and a litany of miseries. Heart, kidney failure, pneumonia, more, just beat me down. I drove myself to an ER one night, smothering. I lived in waiting rooms, counting needles, reading two-year-old field and streams. I piled up kidney stones like they were money, and jabbed myself with a needle insulin twice a day to pay for an ice cream cone. I had in 73. On top of that, old nerve damage in one ear left me with a keening that was murdered late at night. Doctors said I was depressed, and I thought, well, hell, I reckon so. But those meds made me stupid, so I quit. I needed to feel something when I struck a key. I never asked, though, why me? I made a living writing of other people's sadness and harder times than this. It was my turn. I got better, but not all the way back. I couldn't remember the last good decision I made or promise I kept. The truth is that I'd come to think of my life as a story I had already finished. And everything left was just a dull waiting, like cocktail hour at a Howard Johnson's. I guess it happens to a lot of people. The celebrated Texas writer Larry McMurtry made it sound almost like poetry. He wrote of a young frontiersman who lived a rich, sweeping life but always felt an emptiness in him, winding through. Some men were just born outside and beside a river of melancholy. Some men lived a lifetime there. It sounded romantic when I was a young man, till the day I woke up and it was as real as rocks or rain. You never know what you'd find to care about by a river like that. The dog sat on the steps beside me, and he smelled faintly of carrion. I looked down at him. Good boy. That's the end of our first chapter of that book. <laughs>